everyone. This is Karen Serchi of the Surveying Home. I'm a professional organizer here in New York City. I studied in a Marie Kondo in 2016, and I work with families and offices and single people all over the New York City area. So since we are all spending a lot more time at home, we thought it would be kind of fun to do a presentation on KonMari organizing. And I'm gonna give you some tips and some techniques for how to organize your own home. Now, I'm also a member of the National Association of Professional Organizers, and I absolutely believe that traditional organizing um, has a lot to offer as far as really good techniques and methods. So I incorporate both in the work that I do. It has to work for you in your home. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to organizing, but this presentation will show you maybe a different approach or a different way of looking at some ways to manage the things in your home. So let's get started. Um, the first really important thing in KonMari is this idea of a vision. And that essentially means, what would you like your home and your life to be like if things were organized and your life was a little more efficient? Professional organizing, professional organizers did a lot of research on this, this idea of what we spend our time doing. And they found that we spend, on average, about an hour a day looking for things. And that means five minutes for your keys or five minutes for a document on your desk. But over time, it really adds up. The other interesting statistic is that we wear about 20% of the clothing in our closet, which means that 80% of your clothes are seldom, if ever, worn, and they're just in the way. So we really want to take a look at what things are like in your life now and how you would like them to be. This is a lot of work. Getting organized is no fun. You don't want to have to keep doing it over and over again. Now, having a really clear idea of your goals can be super helpful in staying motivated through the process. How would you like your life to look? Would you like to have um, friends over more often? Would you like to have a, a hobby? Would you like to start knitting or crocheting? or painting? Would you like to be able to do yoga or meditate? Would you like to be able to prepare more foods in your kitchen, but you find that it's just too cramped and crowded right now to do that? So having an idea of what you would like for the end result, the goal of all this work, can be really helpful. So keep that in mind as we go through this process. Let's talk a little bit about how KonMari works. Now, as I was saying earlier, there's really nothing new under the sun. All of Marie Kondo's techniques are things that have been used for years. She just put her own personality and her own little spin on some of these ideas. One of my very favorite quotes is from William Morris, who was an interior designer at the turn of the last century, the 1900s, here in New York. He was very famous. He um, designed all of the most important homes in the city, wrote a lot of books, he designed the Morris wallpaper that you may be familiar with. It's very ornate pattern design, very Victorian, but he was considered the utmost in good taste at that time. And his, one of his most famous quotes is, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. And that is really what KonMari is in a nutshell. So keep that idea in mind as we go through this. In KonMari, we, we sort by category, not location. And essentially what that means is that instead of dumping everything out of a particular drawer or out of um, a kitchen cabinet or out of a closet, we're going to look at things by category. And we'll explain what the categories are in a little bit. KonMari has five categories. And it seems that when you look at everything as a whole, when you look at a category as a whole, so for example, you look at all of your office supplies, it's much clearer if you have more than you need or if you have some things that are not serving their purpose as well as other things. And it's a little easier to make a decision about what to keep and what to let go of. So a really good example of this would be a lot of people have multiple white t-shirts in their drawers and maybe you have 10 white t-shirts, but there are only three of them that you ever wear because the rest of them are a little dingy or maybe they don't fit as well. But for whatever reason you have had over the course of time, you've accumulated 10 t-shirts. If you look at them all as a group, it's a little easier to say, I really don't need 
the seven extra ones here and I can let those go. But if you're just looking at things as an individual piece out of, an, out of a location, a lot of times it's more difficult. There is something about taking everything out of a space, so everything out of your clothes closet and looking at it as a group that seems to be much more successful than just maybe going like this with your hangers, going, yes, do I want keep, to keep this or, or not? Uh, if you're being really thoughtful about what you're putting back into your closet, a lot of times you're much more likely to be more selective, which will help you edit things better. Sorting and editing before you organize is also a super important concept. And basically what this means is that you're not even going to think about organizing until after you've sorted and edited your things. A lot of times clients will ask me what they should go get at the container store before we get started, and the answer is nothing. The container store is like Disneyland for disorganized people. You can go up and down those aisles and they have a solution for every problem, even problems you didn't know that you had. And the container store is great and I use them all the time, but we wait until after we've sorted and edited things because way too often people will go and buy bins and baskets from the container store, Amazon or wherever, put all of these things in a bin in a basket, close the lid and forget about them. And they're still taking up space. They're still taking up space in your home. You just haven't really addressed the excess that you have. So save organizing, which is still a very important part until after you've done the sorting and editing. And this is what this can look like. So this was the contents of a closet and this a fairly small wardrobe so we were able to pile everything up on the bed at once. However, what's super important to know is that you can always break things down into smaller categories. It's really important to not get overwhelmed. So if it seems like all of your clothing piled up on the bed and sorted is too much, then you can always use smaller categories. Maybe that means just your t-shirts or maybe that means just your workout clothing. Perfectly fine to do a smaller category of things. But as you can see, once you pile up everything on the bed, you really become, or the floor, wherever you happen to have a flat surface to pile things, you really begin to see how much you've accumulated and the differences between what you have and what you actually use. And it makes it a lot easier to get rid of the things that are just not serving you well. The other concept in KonMari is that you're going to keep only the things that you know you love or need. So all of those maybe someday things, like those extra phone charger cords or the waffle maker for the waffles that you make almost never, or the old craft supplies that you've never gotten around to using, or maybe a book that you only read a few pages of and never finished, and you maybe someday will get back to reading that. It's really important that you take a look at the maybe someday items and get rid of as many of those as possible. Maybe same day items are usually the things that are cluttering up your home the most. So taking a look at the things that you absolutely know to be useful or things that you love is really a good way of getting rid of the excess. Once we do the organizing, we wanna make sure that everything has a permanent home. The scissors and the scotch tape and the stamps and things like that should always be where you expect them. What happens a lot of times is that we get into a hurry or the drawer is too crowded to put things in. So we leave things on top of our flat surfaces, meaning on top of our dining room table or our kitchen counters or our office desktop. And that is how clutter happens. If you think in terms of where you are using things, a lot of times it makes it a lot easier to determine where something should go. But all of that comes after you've done the sorting and organizing and you've gotten rid of the things that you don't need in your home. So let's talk about the categories. Earlier I talked about this idea that categories are, are more important than location when it comes to organizing. In KonMari there are five categories. There's clothing, books, papers, kimono, and sentimental. Kimono is the Japanese word that I'm not pronouncing correctly that means all of the miscellaneous things in your home. And the reason it's one big category like that is because everybody's home is different. 
So some people have babies and they have a lot of baby equipment. Some people have teenage kids and they have a lot of sporting goods, all of the stuff that, uh, all the accumulation that, that teenagers have. You may not have any kids at all, but maybe you have a lot of art supplies or you have um, a lot of things in your kitchen or maybe you have an abundance of toiletries and linens and things like that. Whatever miscellaneous category that you have in your home is something that we look at as a group. The reason that we start with clothing, and it is primarily done in this order, not 100%, but, but generally we try to work in this order, is because you're learning how to make decisions about what is most important to you. And it seems that clothing is one of those things that's easier to learn from. We start with the easiest categories and work to the far harder categories. Clothing is a little easier because you're making decisions about clothing every day. So generally you have a pretty good idea about what looks good on you and what fits and what you prefer. So you know what colors that you like more than others, you know what fabrics you prefer. And it's a little easier to make decisions and to begin to trust your judgment. And trusting your judgment through this process is really what it's all about. I am certainly not an organizer who comes in and says, oh, get rid of this, get rid of that. It's really up to you. In fact, most of the time when people ask me whether they should get rid of something, I just refuse to answer because if that is not what I think about an item, whether I think it looks good on you or not is really not the point. It's really what's working for you. And I want you to learn how to trust your judgment. So we start with something easy like clothing. Sentimental. Sentimental includes everything from photographs to um, furniture that you inherited from your relatives. It includes things like seashells that you've collected on the beach in Montauk. All of those things that you've accumulated over time. Those are the hardest to make decisions about because there's such an emotional impact, such an emotional component of those items. They're no longer the item itself. In other words, a t-shirt, a concert t-shirt that you got when you were 20 years old from a rock and roll show that was like your favorite show that you've had for 40 years is not just a t-shirt anymore. It's a memory. Those seashells from Montauk that you gathered up with your, with your sweetheart or your grandkids are no longer just seashells. They're a memory. So we really kind of detached the item from its original meaning, and we've added an emotional component to it. And that is really what a sentimental item is. And so those things are much more difficult to let go of or to decide whether or not you wanna keep them. So we save that for the end when you have had a lot of practice in deciding what you should keep and let go of. Indecision is the hardest part of getting organized. Not being sure of yourself is really the thing that will keep you from being able to let go of things that are no longer serving you well. So teaching yourself how to do that is really a key component to having a successful organization. Now, KonMari basics. So just to kind of go over how this all works. Again, you're gonna create a vision of your ideal life. You can write it down. Some people do, um, they make a collage of what they would like their life to be like. For some people, it's just something that you have in your heart. You just know what you would like your day to be like. However that works for you is great. Again, you're going to keep only the things that you love or need and things that are doing their job well. So if you are like a lot of us and you have five pairs of scissors that only one of them cuts well, then that will help you make that decision about what you should keep or let go of. You're going to organize your things so that they serve you best. In other words, things that you use a lot should be in easy to access areas. Um, there's really something that I call prime real estate in your home. And that means the shelves that are easy to get to, the drawers that are most convenient, the spaces that you have ready access to, those spaces should only hold the things that you're using all the time. So for example, if possible, it's not a good idea to be storing holiday ornaments in your coat closet because that's a space you're getting into all the time. But a lot of times we end up putting things that are just kind of random or seldom used in available space, which is why when you open up your coat closet, you're like, why is all this stuff in here? Well, you maybe didn't have a better place to put it. But through all this process, you'll begin to reassign spaces in a more appropriate 
manner considering the use of the object and its meaning to you. Be mindful, introspective, and thoughtful about the things that you decide to keep. One of the criteria that I like for people to use is what is the future use of this item? We don't live in museums. We don't live in storage lockers. So if your home is full of things that are all about the past, then what does that mean about your future? Although we always want to respect the past and, and, and our families and, and all the things that came before us are super, super important, we don't live in the past. And your home should accommodate the person that you want to become or the person that you are now. You certainly don't want to be living in a storage locker. And a lot of people feel that they're just living in a storage locker. Your home is for your activities. It's for the things that you want to do and that you need to do every day. So we want to make sure that your home is accommodating you and your life going forward. So how to get started in this whole process. There are a few good tips for doing a good organization of your home. The first thing is dedicate time to the process. In other words, for a lot of people, they'll get really frustrated with the pajama drawer and they'll decide, okay, I'm fed up. I'm just gonna throw everything out of the pajama drawer and everything either gets thrown out or shoved back into the drawer. Or maybe you decided you're just sweeping everything off of the dining room table, and putting it in a basket, and the basket will just sit now for another six months, full of miscellaneous things that never got sorted. By giving yourself a dedicated time to go through this process thoughtfully, you are much more likely to have a successful organization. Um, don't tidy when you're tired. When you're tired. It's really important to make sure that you're feeling fresh and relaxed when you do this because this is hard work and you're going to be making a lot of decisions. And so you wanna make sure that you feel alert, rested, that you're taking good care of yourself while you're doing this. The other thing is you want to plan for at least three hours if possible because it's really hard to get a lot done in less than three hours. Now, for a lot of people, one hour is all they're going to be able to manage. Maybe you have um, physical constraints or maybe you have childcare issues that mean that you're not going to be able to devote more than an hour at a time. That is perfectly fine. You can accomplish a lot in an hour. But if possible, try to give yourself at least three hours to begin to see some real progress in getting organized. No more than five hours at a time. It gets so tiring making all these decisions and you're going to be making a lot of decisions through this process. What I find is after five hours, people start doubting themselves and they start second guessing their decisions. So we don't want that. We want you to feel fresh and rested. We want this to, um, you want to accomplish a lot each time you organize, but you don't want to overdo it. It's okay if this process takes weeks or even months. It took a long time for your home to get disorganized. It may have taken decades for you to have accumulated all the things in your home. There's no need to, to feel like this is something that you need to get done in a weekend. It's just not going to happen. Um, so give yourself plenty of time to accomplish this. So what sparks joy? Again, it really depends on the category and how you're using the item. So in other words, whether or not it's something that you just have because you love looking at it, like a painting or a piece of art or a picture of your grandkids, or if it's something that you really need every day, you know, your, your uh, microwave or, or, you know, the things that you need to get ready in the morning. So those are things that, that, you, that may not spark joy, but you definitely need and love them. What is the emotional or actual cost of keeping the item? Everything takes up space. Every item in your home is occupying a set amount of space that nothing else can occupy. That is just the nature of items. And it's costing you money. So it's costing you either rent or mortgage. It's costing you to heat and cool that item. It's costing you to insure that item. Whatever it is that you are spending on your home. And in New York, a square foot is a lot of money every month. So if you have something that's taking up a square foot of space, we really want to make sure it's worth the amount of space that it's taking up. But there's also the emotional cost. When you walk in at the end of the day and you see your coffee table full of old mail, that's an emotional impact. It's stress, anxiety, it's feeling overwhelmed. So there's an emotional cost of keeping things as well. Would it feel better to get rid of the item? For some people, getting rid of things is not 
comforting. And this is not about how much can you get rid of. Getting organized is not about trying to live a minimalist lifestyle. Most of us will never achieve that, and most of us don't want to achieve that. But it's really important to make sure that what you're keeping are things that you really want to keep that are bringing either they're making your life easier or they're bringing satisfaction to you. Again, think in terms of your future, not your past. How is this item fit into my future going forward? And then a really good question to ask yourself, is the space that this item takes up equal to the joy and happiness or usefulness that it brings me? What if nothing sparks joy? So the big joke uh, that you may have seen, the little cartoons that say, if, if I got rid of everything that didn't spark joy, I would have nothing in my house. Um, of course, not everything is going to spark joy. We're really going back to this idea, is it something that's working for you? Is it doing its job well? Do you have three garlic presses and only one of them works well? Do you have um, a waffle iron on your kitchen counter that you only use once a year? You may love using it, but it's taking up a lot of space and only does one thing. What is the purpose of the item? In other words, is this doing its job well? I have clients who sometimes have those 10 white t-shirts and none of them are working, none of them fit. So they decide that they have to buy, to get rid of the 10 t-shirts and buy something that's working for them. One of the things that happens for everyone through this process is they begin shopping much more thoughtfully. So in the past, somebody might have gone to the Gap and bought five t-shirts for five dollars each because they were on sale even though they weren't that great or they spend 25 dollars after they've gotten organized on only one t-shirt that's perfect for them and worth the money that they've spent on it so it really is about taking a look at what's working for you how well it's working for you and what it's doing for you as you as you decide what you want to keep in your life you have multiple items doing the same thing again going back to this idea and over time, a lot of us have accumulated um, a drawer full of pens, and only a few of them are the ones that we like, or only a few of them are working. So what is the point of keeping a lot of things that are not doing their job well for you? I want to talk a little bit about a couple of categories that are of most concern for the most amount of my clients. And the first one will be the paper and content. I feel like content is also part of the paper category. And for me, content has to do with like your email and your stuff on your computer. The way that I think about that is that content on your computer are things that back before the computer, we would have on paper. So before email, everything was mail that came to us in that fashion. So for me, it makes a little sense to think about it in those same terms. So we're gonna include all of the things that are on your computer in the paper and content organizing category. In KonMari, we have three types of paper. All paper and content falls into one of these categories. The first one is permanent documents. Permanent documents are documents that have important information, such as your social security card, or your mortgage payment papers, or your birth certificate. The information would be um, is unlikely to change over time. So those documents, you know, your marriage license, that information is unlikely to change over time. And if you lost it or you didn't have it, it would be hard to get again. And that means that it would be a real hassle to get your passport again. Not impossible, but it would really not be convenient. So those are considered permanent documents, things that you're likely going to keep forever because the information is never going to change. They're important and it would be hard to get those documents again. The next category is intermediate documents. And those are things that you need to keep for a certain amount of time, but you're waiting for either a date to pass or someone to do something. So what that means essentially is that it could be an invitation. You're keeping the invitation until the wedding that's coming up in the summer. You're keeping the tax documents for seven years but you don't need to keep them any longer than seven years. You're keeping the medical billing statement until you've had a conversation with the doctor's office to resolve an issue that you have with the bill. 
it can apply to email in the sense that you are waiting for somebody to get back to you about a question that you emailed them about. Maybe you're waiting for a response. So you have, you're keeping the email in your inbox until you get that response. Those are the kinds of things that fall into intermediate documents. And you're keeping those documents for a certain, certain amount of time, but you can let them go after the situation is resolved. Then the final category are immediate action items, action items. These are things that if you had a few minutes, you could sit down and take care of right now. So that could be a bill that you could actually pay today if you had a few minutes to sit down and write out the check, for example. It could be a thank you note that you want to write. It could be a phone call that you need to return. So you have like the little reminder of those things that you're keeping on hand so that you can take care of that issue as soon as you have the opportunity. All paper and content falls into one of those three categories. And if you can think in terms of what category does this piece of paper fall into, it'll make it a lot easier to know whether or not you should keep it or not. If you're looking at an old newspaper from a week ago, you can pretty safely say, if I haven't looked at this newspaper in a week, buying some article that I know that I'm going to utilize in some fashion in the future, you are unlikely to read that newspaper. And it makes it a little easier to get some of those piles of mail off of your, off of your desk. Getting rid of things. So this is the part of the presentation that's really challenging right now because we are all in this strange situation where getting rid of things, getting them out of our homes is not as easily easy as it was just a few weeks ago. I've walked by Housing Works and it's closed. I'm pretty sure that the Goodwill store on 72nd Street is closed and probably most of them as well are as well. So being able to run stuff over to a donation center is just not going to be a doable thing. And some of us, of course, have decided to not leave at all. So um, that's not even an option. Getting rid of things as, sooner, as soon as you can is always the best idea. I have clients who drive around for months with bags full of donations in their trunk. And that, of course, is not a good idea. I have clients who I go into their homes and they have bags of donations piled up in a closet. You really haven't gotten the item out until it's actually out of your home. Having said that, when you've piled up the things that you've decided you no longer need, put them in a pile, put them in a corner, put them wherever you need to so they're not invading your living space, but that you know as soon as the coast is clear and we are able to resume our more normal lives, that you'll get those out the door as soon as possible. Having said that, donation, of course, is um, a good way to, to pass things along. A lot of people wonder, and I think somebody had mentioned on the board about things like socks. Well, I try, usually, to not donate anything like um, dirty things or underwear, um, unless it's brand new in the package, because certainly then if it's brand new in the package, that's very desirable. But if it's just old things that are clean, um, it's okay to put those in the donation bag. A lot of times I'll put them in a separate bag so that the people at the donation center don't have to dig through those things as well. And the reason it's okay is because a lot of donation centers utilize fabric recycling, textile recycling, and they bundle up the things that they can't sell. And by the way, donation centers are usually only able to sell or use a small percentage of the things that are donated. That's just the nature of uh, donations these days so a lot of the things that are not able that don't get sold are packaged up bundled up and sold to textile recyclers and some of those things are um, shredded up and used for insulation in places like South America or um, in the African continent um, so they, they're useful to somebody and so it's important to go ahead and donate those things whenever you can. Things that, items of clothing that may not be of interest to people in this area may be of great interest to somebody in the, another part of the world. So go ahead and feel free to donate those things whenever possible. The other option is selling and consigning. Um, Poshmark is a great resource. Poshmark, it's P-O-S-H-M-A-R-K. And it's an online 
um, it's like eBay and that you can list things and sell them. The problem with it, of course, is that it's work for you and you're keeping the item and sending it to the person who purchases it. And so it's not getting out of your house that quickly. Um, the other option is consignment or actually people who will buy, their, buy your item from you. So places like Buffalo Exchange or Crossroads are two companies in the city that under normal circumstances will buy your things outright. The other option for consignment, um, the real real, which is an online seller of luxury goods, and they're great. They um, take mostly luxury items. Linda's stuff, Linda's stuff, she is an eBay seller that I use all the time. Um, and you put things in a box and send them off to her. She will list them for you. She has this big warehouse in Philadelphia and a lot of staff and they put things up online. And if things don't get sold, then she donates them for you on your behalf or you can have them sent back to you. Um, the most important thing about selling and consigning is that you're never going to get back the amount of money that you put into them with a very few um, set of exceptions, like some super, super high-end handbags. Most of the time, you're only going to get a small fraction of their value back. It's just the way it is. There are so many things in the resale market these days. But some is better than nothing. And in fact, I have a client who just recently got $4,000 back from the real real for selling some jewelry that she had that was nice jewelry, but it was just not something that she wore. They were not her taste. And she sent them off to the real real and was surprised to get $4,000 back for her item. So sometimes you can get some, some real return back from those items. And certainly if you're not using them, then it might be worth it. Recycle is the last thing to keep in mind. Obviously we wanna recycle as much as possible. Um, a lot of things are gonna end up in a landfill and throughout this whole experience, if I have learned anything as an organizer, it's that we overconsume so much stuff, whether it's fast fashion or the amount of plastic that we have, or just the accumulation of things is really, um, it's really a challenge that we will be facing for the next generation. So whenever possible, try to recycle things. It's, um, it's very hard and challenging to recognize that things like all of your old CDs or your VHS tapes are just um, of not of value as far as the item, but sometimes the plastic can be recycled. If you have um, electronics, Best Buy will take back your electronics and recycle them. Apple will take back the Apple products when they're open again and they'll recycle them as well as wipe the data off of those so that if you have personal information, they will remove that for you before they recycle them. Again, the most important thing is try not to put things back away um, until you've had a chance to get them out of your home. And that's when you really begin to realize, wow, I have actually um, made some new space in my home. So let's talk about the organizing part. You may be familiar with Marie Kondo's um, folding. And again, she kind of put her own twist on some well-known ideas about um, how to fold clothes. But a lot of people find this super interesting. And, and it actually can be very relaxing. I know that sounds um, impossible to think of folding as being relaxing, but it can be, once you get the hang of it, it can be something um, that feels very soothing and relaxing to do. I know that sounds hard to believe, but if you love everything that you're folding, um, it can really be a good way to, to honor the things that you've decided to keep. You may have seen um, the vertical up and down kinds of organizing that she does in drawers. And again, we'll show you, I'll show you a video in just a minute of how to do that to some articles of clothing. In addition, after this, once the video, once our presentation is over, you could please send me an email. I have some diagrams that I've had made up on how to fold different articles of clothing, everything from pants to hoodies to t-shirts, and I'm happy to share those with you. So just send me an email after you've watched this and I'll send that over to you. Um, in Kanmai organizing, things should be where you use the item. So that is going back to this idea that everything should have a permanent home in, um, in a place that's most useful to you. Things should be visible so that when you open up a drawer or you look at a cabinet or a closet, 
you can um, see everything there that will keep you from over buying things because if you know that you have five cans of tomato soup you are less likely to go buy another five cans at the store if you don't remember that you have it so that is a great way to keep track of your items and to keep yourself from over buying and also it makes it easier to get the things that you want to get to when you need them so i'm going to switch over to the video hope that this works Now, I am going to demonstrate how to fold clothes. The key point here is to feel the piece of clothing with your hands and communicate your affection through your palms. It is very important to have this thought in mind while you fold your clothes. Folding clothes is not about making it compact, but it is about love to communicate your affection and gratitude for their continuous support. First, fold both sleeves like this. Now, make a long rectangle with the body of the item in the middle. Then, fold it in half. And then, fold into a third. When a piece of clothing is folded correctly, it will stand. Let's fold other pieces of clothing in the same way. For a camisole, once again, get a feel for the piece. Stroke it with your hands. The basics of folding here is to fold the width ways to a third. The key point with camisole is to include the straps as part of its length and fold almost in half. And then fold, fold again into a third. Et voilà, it stands up. Now, let's fold socks. What I do not recommend is to make them into a ball like this. Why not? Because the elastic in the opening of the sock gets ruined. Correctly, put both socks together by laying one on the other. And fold in half. Once again, in half. When they are folded correctly, they will also stand. As you see, fold all the clothes in such a way so that they stand on their own. They will look neat and tidy. Okay, so um, again, I'm happy to share with you some folding diagrams that I've had made that show you how to um, show other things. Oh, let's see. Hold on. Okay, hold on, we get back to our show. Here we go. All right, so like I said, I'll be happy to send you my um, folding documents so you can practice on your own. And again, it's something that has to work for you. But let me show you a few photos of some good organization examples. So here are some cardigan sweaters, some lightweight summery sweaters that are folded to um, stand up like little books and 
they are folded in the vertical folding method. But the great thing about this is that they're on a shelf and you can see every single one of these. So when you're looking for a sweater, instead of having them piled up on top of each other, you can take one out and then put it back when you're done with it. It just makes it so much easier. A lot of times if you stack things up horizontally, meaning that you're stacking things on top of each other, the one at the bottom is almost never worn. Or every time you try to get something out from the bottom of the pile, it all ends up in a big mess. So if you have things like this, a lot of times they just stay neater longer. The next thing I wanna talk with you about is this idea of how things should be in your closet. Now, obviously, if things are super tailored, like a coat or a blazer or something of that nature, it's always going to be hung in a closet. If something is really a delicate fabric, like um, silk, or linen, something that wrinkles very easily, we definitely wanna put that uh, in a closet as a hung item as well. But whatever works for you. I had a client who had absolutely no drawers or no shelves, but she had, her entire closet was nothing but um, holes for hanging clothes. She also had, and the mainstay of her wardrobe were um, printed t-shirts. She had dozens and dozens of printed t-shirts and almost all of them were black t-shirts with printing on them. If we would have folded those up in a drawer, she would have never been able to find the one that she wanted because it just, she would not have been able to see what each one um, had on its front. And she loved wearing these t-shirts. She was an artist and she wore t-shirts all the time. So we hung every one of her t-shirts and it looked beautiful. And it was a great way for her to keep track of her things and to find the things that she wanted to wear every day. Um, and uh, it worked for her. So everything that, when it comes to good organization, if it doesn't work for you, it's not going to be good organization. So just keep that in mind when you're evaluating how to store your items. Here is a kitchen drawer. Now in this drawer, you can see that uh, they have their bags folded up because now we are moving away from our plastic grocery bags. Um, and so the bags are all right there, ready to go. And the table linens and other things, the pot holders are all kept in this drawer and everything can be seen. So as needed, they can be easily removed and put back when not in use. Here is um, a drawer of jeans and sweatpants folded in the vertical method. And as you can see, this is what she means by vertical. It's not piled up on top of each other. Everything is up and down. So things are easy to get out and easy to put away. It's easy to see what's in the drawer. And this is a kitchen cabinet. Now in this cabinet, um, going back to this idea of prime real estate, the things that are used most often are down in the most accessible shelf. So the coffee cups and the daily use bowls and glasses and the hand soap are all kept here on the lower shelf. And then things like the dessert tray or the dessert plates and flower vases are kept higher because they're used and they're loved, but they're just not used as often. What do you do when your family is also messy? A lot of times people will call me about their family member um, and they'll say things like, even if I got organized, it wouldn't matter because my husband, wife, mom, kids are messier than I am. Unfortunately, um, this is one of those things where you have to focus on yourself, but by setting a good example, a lot of times the rest of your family will come around. It's super important to know that if you focus on your own clutter, a lot of times will people, people in your family will see the benefit of getting organized. And with time and patience, they will come around and perhaps become a bit more organized. One of the things that you can do, lead by example, have patience. Another thing though, is that it's okay to set rules for common areas. So. If you have a roommate who is piling up their things on the dining room table, it's okay to say, you know, this is an area that we all share. 
it's okay if you want to keep your clothes the way you want to keep them or your um, books the way you want to keep them. But when it comes to an area that we share together, could we come up with rules that will work for all of us? And maybe this means that you have a basket on the dining room table where all of the, the other family members' things go. Um, coming to some compromise in the meantime is perfectly okay because it's, you do have a right to have the spaces that you use in your home be the way that you would like to keep them. One goal and one of the things that um, seems to come in handy when you're thinking about how you want your home to look is that flat surfaces should be for activities and not storage. So in other words, this applies to things like desktops, dresser tops, dining room tables, um, kitchen counters, all of those spaces that we tend to pile up items. Think in terms of those spaces being used for activities. So in other words, your dining room table should be used for eating only. Your kitchen countertop should be used for preparing food only. So if there are things that are piled up on these spaces that are keeping you from being able to do those activities, then your organization is not really working. So sometimes by setting that as a ground rule in your family, it'll help them start thinking in terms of organization. The things that don't work are getting mad, getting angry, um, making threats. Those things just don't work. If they did, most of our kids in our homes would be a lot more organized. So let's talk about the hardest category, and that is the sentimental category. And again, this is, this is one of the, the most difficult categories for those reasons that I was talking about earlier, that the items that fall into this category are things that have an emotional value to them. They're not just photographs. They're memories of your family. It's not just your aunt's china set. It's a memory of your aunt. So these things can be really super difficult. However, if everything is important, then nothing is important. And by that I mean that if you keep every single doodle that your child made growing up, then it becomes really hard to appreciate and enjoy the things that were meaningful. So when it comes to things like your children's artwork, I like to think in terms of what, what things represent their personality or their skill when they were a particular age. So for example, the first time that they made a Mother's Day card for you with no one's help is certainly something that you would want to keep. Um, a, a, the card, the birthday card that your Aunt Mary wrote to you with a heartfelt sentiment about what a wonderful niece or nephew you were is certainly something to keep. But the dozens of cards that are just signed, love Aunt Mary, maybe are not as important. So you really want to just think in terms of like, what are the things that are really emotionally valuable to me instead of just keeping things. Gifts are so hard. Um, we all have gifts and our gifts that have been given to us by people that we love, but we don't love the gift. When someone gives you a gift, it's they're expressing their love or care or appreciation for you. They do not mean that you are obligated to take care of that item forever. So there's a lot of things that you can do with gifts that kind of fall out of the category, uh, kind of fall out of the scope of our presentation today. But thinking in terms of whether or not um, you are keeping the gift out of obligation can help you make a decision about whether or not you really need to keep, um, you know, the fifth plaid scarf that your mom knit for you. Maybe keeping the one that is most important to you or that you love the most is okay. What are some other ways to enjoy a memory? Um, an example of this is that I had a, a client who was uh, a sports person and they were engaged in a particular sport and, and very successfully had won lots and lots of medals and lots and lots of awards and kept all of these awards in a closet in a home, in their home and filled the closet. Of course, he never used these items and only displayed a couple of them but these were all very meaningful to him. Well, they were getting ready to move to a place where these things could just not be accommodated. They didn't know what to do because these were all very meaningful to him. But it wasn't so much about the award itself. It was about the memory of the event, of the contem uh, uh, 
competition of his um, of his participation in the event. So what we did was he, we lined them all up and took a photo of each one separately so that he would be able to keep a photo of the award. And then he was able without a care to let them go. And it didn't, it was not hard at all once he knew that he would be able to look back at his photos and remember the event. He, he kept a, a few that were most important to him, but the, the vast majority of them were just taking up space. And again, going back to this idea, what is the future use of this item? What are you planning on doing with this item in the future? Is it, um, is it important to your family that you act as the um, keeper of all the memories? Or can you hold on to the things that are most important and let go of some of the rest? So when it comes to Kanmai, I feel that there are certain things that are most important. And again, really going back to this idea that what you keep in your life should be important to you. Um, do I care enough about this item to take care of it? So in other words, are you okay with being the caretaker of a bunch of white blouses that have to be ironed? Uh, do you have a pile of things that need to be mended? A lot of times, if you really wanted those enough, you would have already taken care of them. If it's something that requires a lot of upkeep, is it something that you're willing to do? Is it adding value to your life? What is the future use of this item? Again, my, my big motto is thinking in terms of how that item is serving you in the future, and does it fit into my vision of my best life going forward? And that is all I have to share with you today. Um, I could talk for hours about this topic, but in the meantime, please go to my website, thesereneHome.com. You can um, subscribe to my newsletter there. I promise I don't send them out very often, so I won't be spamming your inbox. I also have a podcast called the Spark Joy Podcast. It's at sparkjoypodcast.com. You can also find a link to that on my website. And I am a co-host. Uh, my co-host in Chicago do an episode every week and we talk about getting organized. We talk about living your best life. We just put out an episode on how to keep you and your home healthy during our healthcare crisis right now, which I hope you'll find interesting. And again, this was great fun. I really appreciate um, being able to share my great passion with you and I hope you are all well and that you have a much success in getting organized. Thanks so much.